Jesus Christ is the light of the world, <clears throat> the light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening, and the day is almost over. Be our light and scatter the darkness, and hear our evening prayer and praise. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who led your people Israel with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Enlighten our darkness by the light of your Christ. May his word be a lamp to our feet and a light for our path. For you are merciful and you love your whole creation. We, your creatures, glorify you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Oh, I call to you, come to me quickly. Hear my voice when I cry to you. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Let the incense of our prayers rise before you, O Lord, and let your mercy descend on us, that we may sing your praises with the church on earth and forever in heaven, through Jesus Christ our Lord. We hear the fourth portion of the Passion history compiled from the four Gospels. As soon as it was day, the council of the elders of the people met together, both chief priests and experts in the law. They brought Jesus into their Sanhedrin and said, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer me or release me. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. They all said then, Are you then the Son of God? He said to them, I am what you are saying. Then they said, Why do we need any more testimony? For we ourselves have heard from his own mouth 
Then the chief priests and the elders and experts in the law, together with the whole Sanhedrin, reached a decision. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he felt remorse. He brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders and said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is that to us? That's your problem. He threw the pieces of silver into the temple and left. Then he went out and hanged himself. The chief priests took the pieces of silver and said, it's not lawful to put these into the treasury since it is blood money. They reached a decision to buy the potter's field with the money as a burial place for foreigners, so that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price the sons of Israel had set for him, and they gave them for the potter's field, just as the Lord commanded me. Early in the morning, the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium. They did not enter the Praetorium themselves so that they would not become ceremonially unclean. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover meal. So Pilate went out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate told them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews said, It is not legal for us to put anyone to death. This happened so that the statement Jesus had spoken, indicating what kind of death he was going to die, would be fulfilled. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow misleading our nation, forbidding the payment of taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? It is as you say, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things. When he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Pilate questioned him again. Are you not going to answer anything? See how many charges they are bringing against you. But Jesus still did not answer anything, so Pilate was amazed. Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus. He asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus replied, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. You are a king then, Pilate asked. Jesus answered, I am, as you say, a king. For this reason I was born, and for this reason I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. What is truth? Pilate said to him. After he said this, he went out again to the Jews and told them, I find no basis for a charge against him. But they kept insisting, He stirs up the people, teaching all throughout Judea, beginning from Galilee, all the way here. When Pilate heard this, he asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that he was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod who was also in Jerusalem during those days. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad. For a long time he had wanted to see him, because he had heard many things about him. He hoped to see some miracle performed by him. He questioned him with many words, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the experts in the law stood there vehemently accusing him. Herod, along with his soldiers, treated him with contempt and ridiculed him. Dressing him in bright clothing, Herod sent Jesus back to Pilate. Herod and Pilate became friends with each other on that day. Before this, they had been enemies of each other. So far the Passion history.
We join in tonight's hymn in the hour of trial. Grace and mercy and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. What did Peter see in Jesus? We look tonight at Luke chapter 22, selected verses, beginning with these first two. Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. What did Peter see in Jesus? At times, it seems Peter saw more than the other disciples, or at least he's the one that said it out loud. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Or remember on the Sea of Galilee, Lord, if it's you... Tell me to come out to you on the water. Or this classic, Lord, should we strike with our swords? Bold and brave Simon Peter. What does he see in himself, first of all? He sees him in himself, the John Wayne of the Apostles. But what did Peter see in Jesus? Some scholars like to speculate psychologically that perhaps Peter was bullied as a kid, always getting pushed around, being called dumb, and it, it turned him into the kind of a man that wanted to prove that, 
that he was a big man. So the speculation goes anyways. Now you know that when Peter first meets Jesus, his reaction is one of great humility. He falls to his knees. This is after that miraculous catch of fish and he says, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. But he seems to have recovered fairly quickly from that low opinion of himself and has stepped fairly easily into a leadership role. So what did Peter see in Jesus? Maybe the chance to be a real somebody, to be a warrior for the kingdom of heaven. Well, if there's any truth in any of that psychological speculation, it makes Peter's crash and burn in the courtyard of the high priest all the more awful. But forget the speculation. What matters most is what did Peter finally see in Jesus? And as we look at that, it will help you and me to see Jesus more clearly too. Simon, Simon, Satan asked, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. This is after the Passover meal. It says the disciples are making their way to Gethsemane and Jesus has an urgent message, a personal message that he needs to say to Simon. Simon, Simon, he says to him. His old name, not the new name that Jesus had given him. Peter, the rock, but no, his old name. And he says it twice, Simon, Simon. The way Jesus said, Martha, Martha. Or, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. This is the way a parent talks to a child that thinks too highly of itself to listen. Simon, Simon. Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. You can't see it in English, but the you in that sentence is plural. Satan is asked to, to sift all of you disciples as wheat. Satan wants to get his hands on them all. He wants to sift them like wheat, to violently shake them the way a farmer would do with wheat in a, in a sieve to separate, to separate the heads of wheat from the chaff. Satan wants to do it violently in order to shake their faith, God grants permission because he too wants the disciples sifted. He wants the kernels of wheat, the faith to be sifted away from the chaff of unbelief and worldliness and foolishness. Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, says Jesus, but I have prayed for you, singular, Peter. I have prayed for you in particular, Peter. Why? Because Peter is going to fall harder than all the other disciples. Precisely because he is so cocksure of himself. I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. This brings to mind the way that the first chapter of Job describes Satan coming to bring hardship into Job's life. Satan has to ask permission of God. The same here. Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. Pay attention to that comforting thought. Satan is a wild dog, but he's on a chain still. 
a comforting reminder, wouldn't you say? Satan can go no further than God allows. As St. Paul reminds us, he is not allowed to tempt us beyond what we can bear, and God has promised he will give us an escape or the strength to stand up under it. Sadly, Peter, being personally warned by the Lord, is arrogantly defensive. And unfortunately, he's proud, too proud to listen to the Savior's warning. More than once in the Gospel accounts, Peter maintains that he's ready to go to prison or to death with Jesus. He would rather die with Jesus than deny him. But in not one of those cases does Peter make that confession the way we do in our confirmation vows. I vow to remain faithful even in the face of death to faith. How do we end those vows? With the help of God, right? By the grace of God, as God gives me strength. None of that from Peter. With him, it's all bravado and arrogance that needs to be shaken out of him in that sieve before the rooster crows. It's a changed Peter later in life who writes in his epistles, clothe yourself with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Those words came from a man who has finally learned that you can never trust in yourself little enough. And you can never trust in Jesus too much. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance but when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, This man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. So you can identify with Peter, can't you? You've heard this account so many lengths, and haven't you always kind of painted your own face into the character of Peter? You're frightened at how quickly everything has gone down in Gethsemane. One minute, you're getting woken up for falling asleep during Jesus' prayer. The next minute, you've lopped off somebody's ear, and then Jesus puts the ear back on, and he gets led away by a contingent of soldiers accompanied by Judas, one of your own. Meanwhile, you and all the other disciples scatter like a bunch of cockroaches and set off running, running as fast as you can until finally you can't run anymore and you stop and you bend over and over the huffing and the puffing and the heart pounding in your chest, you hear no other sound. They're not following you. So you double back and retrace your footsteps. You can hear the muffled voices in the distance and you can see their torches. And so you follow along in the same direction, always remembering to keep a safe distance. You don't want to get yourself arrested. Your younger fellow disciple John has doubled back before you. He's gone to the courtyard of the high priest and somehow we don't know the connection but John was familiar with Annas and Caiaphas. They were familiar with him and so he was able to get permission to go into the courtyard. 
And he spoke to the girl in charge and got Peter in. Peter, John has not done you a favor. Spring nights in Jerusalem, 2,500 feet above sea level is chilly. Not to mention the fact that you're already shaking like a leaf from fear. So you gravitate toward the fire that the soldiers have made in the middle of the courtyard. You, you warm up your hands, try to get that shaking to stop. You ease your way into the huddle and you listen, overhear the, the muffled conversations going on. You're trying to remain completely unnoticed. You're trying to blend in. But then there's the gal who ushered you in. She catches your eyes. She looks you up and down. You're getting nervous. And then she blurts out, you're also one of them. You were with him too, weren't you? And immediately the defense mechanism springs into action and you say bluntly and as solidly as you can, woman, I don't know the man. I'm not one of them. And then you start moving toward the exit. You're so agitated that you don't even take note of the fact that in the background already a rooster has crowed once. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. Another finger pointed. And once again, you freeze. And at this point, everything gets thrown into slow motion. It's a hard and difficult moment for you. One thing follows another. It's one thing to confess boldly and out loud in front of all your friends, the fellow disciples. Yes, Jesus means everything to me. I would rather die with Jesus than to deny him. It's another thing to admit it surrounded by icy stares trying to make out all the details of your face in the firelight. People who, if you admit to them that you follow Jesus, will at the very least ridicule you and everything you hold dear. And in that slow motion moment, you reason to yourself, a person needs to tailor the things to the situation after all. Church is church, and this ain't church. I'm not amongst friends. It's different, isn't it? This thing between me and Jesus and Jesus and me, it can remain a secret, right? And so for the second time, you say, man, I am not. You need breathing space. So you move about still within warming distance of the fire. And you look up and see that more eyes are studying your face. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Who put those roosters in Jerusalem anyway? Somewhere in the distance, one crows in the early morning darkness. This time, you do hear it. This time, your head jerks up. You look up toward the palace of the high priest and you see your friend cuffed, beaten, bruised, being led away with the spit of his enemy still dripping from
from his face. Your eyes meet his eyes. What do you see? Your friend, your teacher, your Lord, your Savior, the one you just told everybody that you don't know. And your friend looks at you. And that's all it takes. Law and gospel in one glance. It's a glance of pain. His pain. You have added to it on this dark night. It's not enough that he has to bear the hatred of his people and the kiss of the traitor. To it all, you added the cowardice of a friend who only hours before had promised never to deny him. What do you see in Jesus, Peter? Pain? Disappointment? Yes. What do you see in Jesus, Peter? Love. Undeserved love. You crumble. You melt. You remember what he told you that you did not want to hear. Your eyes well up and you stumble out of the courtyard, running through the streets and alleys of Jerusalem, your conscience in hot pursuit. You sob until you can shake and cry no more. You are so ashamed, so disgusted with yourself, all because you took your eyes off Jesus the same way you did that night on the Sea of Galilee, and you sunk. You told yourself that time, this will never happen again. I will never take my eyes off my loving, all-powerful Savior. Even if I have to die, it'll never happen again. That night, in Jesus, Peter saw a dangerous man who could bring him guilt and danger by association. What should Peter have seen in him? A savior who brings safety and freedom from guilt by association. Peter, I share your tears. Your disgust with yourself. Why does it take me a lifetime to learn this? To see that the gospel is not about me, strong me. The gospel is not about me at all. The gospel is all about Jesus. The law is about me. The law tells me how weak I am and how sinful I am. The gospel tells me all about my friend and Savior. His life counts for the life that I have so miserably messed up. His payment for sin becomes my payment. His death drains my death of all its poison. And his resurrection shines a light into the dark black hole of my grave. The gospel does not tell me how I ought to feel about Jesus. The gospel tells me about how Jesus does feel about me and what he did for me. How can I be ashamed of this gospel? How can I be ashamed of my friend? Bless your tears, big fisherman. By God's grace, you have tears of sorrow and shame. And peace in his pardon. Not all do. 
Many still look at him in the face and harden their hearts. Bless your repentance, big fisherman. Now you see Jesus clearly. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. In peace let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of your church throughout the world, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the leaders of our synod, for all pastors in Christ and for all the people of God, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who govern our nation and for all public servants, that they may be upheld and strengthened for every good deed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who work to bring peace, justice, health, and protection in this and every place, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For favorable weather, for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, and for peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our deliverance from all affliction, wrath, danger, and need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the faithful who have gone before us and are with Christ, let us give thanks to the Lord. Thanks be to Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Rejoicing in the fellowship of all the saints, let us commend ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ our Lord. To you, O Lord. Lord God, all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works come from you. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments. Defend us also from the fear of our enemies, that we may live in peace and quietness, through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us praise the Lord and thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Light has 
our Savior, wash away all that I've done wrong today. Make me ever more like you, good and gentle, kind and true. Let my near and dear ones be safe with you eternally. Oh, bring me and all I love to your happy home above. Now my evening praise I you once died that I might live. All your precious gifts are free. Oh, how good you are to me. Ah, my best and kindest friend.